This week on the Readwell podcast, I am discussing the Brothers Karamazov. Now, this book is getting a lot of hype. It was written in the 19th century by Fyodor Dostoevsky, but a lot of people are turning to it now to answer major, major questions about life, God, personality, and so on. So if you're thinking about tackling this thing, my goal today is to help you decide whether or not this is a good investment of time for you. Let's get into it. Welcome to this week's episode of the Read Well Podcast. My name is Eddie Hood, and I'm your host, where I believe it's more important to read well than to be well read. So grab your favorite book, open up your notes, and let's get ready to learn something fascinating. We are tackling major conversations today in the Read Well Podcast. I am so excited about this week's episode because we are discussing one of the greatest works of literary fiction ever created. And there's a reason for this, right? Because uh, the Brothers Karamazov, I've got my copy of it right here. This is a book that does more than just entertain you. In fact, uh, John Paul Sartre, the French philosopher, said of literature that it is the writer's job to not only entertain you, but to actually compel you to change your worldviews, to see things anew, to live life at a different level. In fact, Sartre argued that if a writer does not do that, if he or she simply is trying to entertain you, it's almost a sin, really. He thinks that, or he thought that uh, writing should elevate the reader. And uh, The Brothers Karamazov is a great example of that. This is a book that walks you through the deepest questions you've probably asked yourself at some point or another in your own life. Questions about who you are, why you do the things that you do, uh, whether or not there's a God. Uh, if so, why do bad things happen to good people? How do families uh, get along? Why are they so dysfunctional? This book hits all of these topics and more. And today I want to talk about why it's an incredible book to read. And spoiler alert here, uh, I absolutely think you should read this book, but I want to make sure that you read it with the right mindset. I'm going to give you a couple tips on how to read Dostoevsky at the end of this uh, podcast. For those of you that have decided, you know what, I'm doing it. I'm going to read this book and commit to it because it is no small feat. This is, this is an 800 plus page work of Russian fiction. So, uh, you know, if you've never read works by a Russian author before, it's a, it's a different sort of feeling to the pros. I'll get into that at the end of the video here today, at the end of the podcast. But what I want to make this episode about, I'm not going to give you any spoilers because I want you to read it, but I do want you to understand what you're going to walk away with, assuming you read this book. You know, I, I want you to know sort of what you'll get for your investment of time. And there are several things that I've identified that I got out of this book through my first read. Now, uh, I will tell you this, this will not be my only time reading The Brothers Karamazov. I can't think of any majorly long work of fiction where I've thought, wow, I want to read that again. But this book will probably be read many times in my life because it's one of those, those sort of layered stories. So before we get into this, make sure you have your favorite beverage. I have mine. Yes, there's some caffeine in this to keep me going. All right, let's get started. So the very first idea... I want to share with you guys today is that you are a complicated creature. Now, the Brothers Karamazov is all about human nature and the suffering we experience in this life and the joys and the passions, all of the things. But ultimately, it's a book about the complications of the human heart. And if you've ever thought to yourself, man, I am a I'm a hot mess, right? Like, I just, I can't seem to get my crap together. I don't know what's going on. I'm overwhelmed. I'm stressed. This book does a really beautiful job of encapsulating that, that sort of way of thinking. And one, helps you realize you're not alone in thinking that way about yourself. But two, allows you to sort of learn to process that complication. So, each and every one of us are our own unique mixture of mental challenges, physical challenges, emotional challenges. And on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to wrestle with those things. And the, Brother, the Brothers Karamazov is a book that sort of holds up a mirror to you as you read. And what I mean by that is Dostoevsky was this incredibly gifted um, sort of man who understood 
psychological um, issues, traits, persona, and so on. And he was able to stick those qualities into his characters. So every one of the Dostoevsky characters you're going to read are going to be so rich and detailed that you're going to see yourself in these characters. I saw myself in part in almost all of these characters, right? The things that they felt, the way that they behaved, uh, the, sort of the, the kindness that they had, the meanness that they had, and so on. You're reading this book going, man, I, I, I act this way in my own secret heart sometimes. And it's, it's really sort of kind of eye-opening to, to have an author expose that, that human condition to you. So first and foremost, you're going to see yourself in these characters and you're going to understand a little bit more about um, sort of the human condition, right? Because every day we wake up and we have, we have temptations and we have laziness and we have all of these things. And in most works of fiction, you don't really get that. You get a character or a group of characters who have a mission, right? Especially in contemporary literature where they are out to achieve a goal. And it's almost more about the action uh, that they take, about the sort of the plan that they follow that keeps people reading books these days. But in Dostoevsky's time, uh, his, his books are not just about the things that they do, but it's about why they do the things that they do. And that's why it's a powerful thing to read because, you know, you, you, you get a chance to sort of understand uh, the decisions that you make. So that's the first reason why I would suggest you read The Brothers Karamazov is if you are internally um, trying to process your own life, your own struggles, your own thoughts, your own questions, your own needs, this is a great book because it, it sort of exposes you to those ideas. Okay. Now, the brothers Karamazov, in the name, dis, you know, it, it describes the idea that this is about a family, a bunch of brothers. Now, there's a father in this book as well, and I'm not going to give any of the details away because, again, I want you to read the book. But the brothers themselves are beautiful because each one of them has a very distinct personality. And this leads us into the second reason why I think you should read this work. Well, I'm going to tell you about these three brothers uh, just in general. I don't want to give too much away, but the first, his name is Dimitri. He's the oldest brother. And Dimitri is what he would call a sensualist. He's very into living worldly, living with passion. So he's into you know alcohol and women and living fast and just uh, sensing the moment, living for right now. And I think that's something that uh, in, in, in whether small part or large part, we can all identify with a little bit, right? There's been times in all of our lives where we've thought, I just want to live for the moment. You know, I don't want to invest in tomorrow. I don't want to save my money. I want to go nuts right now. <laughs> I want to spend my paycheck today. And this is the Dimitri in all of us. He is this person that just grabs life by the horns and rides as fast as he can. And as you're experiencing life through Dimitri's eyes, you kind of have this moment of like, man, I, I do this sometimes. And you see the consequences of Dimitri's actions. And you can kind of parallel those with the, the consequences you face in your own life. So it's this really cool experience. So you've got Dimitri. He's the oldest brother. Now, the next one is Ivan. Ivan is the intellectual. He is the person in the book who uh, comes at life with logic only. So he approaches everything with reason. He, he sees it through a black and white lens of yes or no. There's no middle ground for Ivan. It is, it is a right or wrong. And he is somebody that uh, I think sort of inspires me quite a bit. I, can, I think a lot like Ivan sometimes where I love to sort of intellectualize about things, sometimes to my own detriment, right? Sometimes I overthink things. I get too deep into the books of philosophy or the questions of life. And I like to sit in those areas and really think about them and journal about them. This is Yvonne. Yvonne does this kind of uh, living. So you, you've got this brother who approaches life uh, as, as a problem, as a, as a formula per se. The, the third brother is Alyosha. And Alyosha is the more emotional, spiritual, sensitive, loving, forgiving person. This is the person we all sort of aspire to be, or at least think maybe we should be. And Alyosha is uh, what Dostoevsky uh, calls the, the main uh, protagonist of the book. Some would disagree with that. But at any rate, Alyosha is this incredible character because he adds a a sort of softness, a sort of sensibility to the book that the other brothers and the father don't have. 
Now, these are just the three brothers. There's actually a fourth brother, uh, which you'll learn about in the book as you read. And he brings a different sort of set of, of criteria. But we don't usually look at the fourth brother as sort of a personality type because he's, he's I hate to say he's an afterthought, but he's a little bit of an afterthought, although he is a major player in the story. But when you're looking at personalities in psychology, Dimitri, Ivan, and Alyosha are really, really um, sort of this cogent view of life, right? Because we can see ourselves in them. And what's even more powerful is that when you combine these three, the sensualist, the intellectual, and the spiritual, isn't that us in whole, right? In, in whatever sort of ratio of those you are, you've got a little bit of all of those in you. And so that's why it's powerful to read about these brothers, because you can see yourself acting as them in some way or aspiring to be or not be like them in other ways. So it's really incredible. Now, I have left out of this conversation the father. The father, Fyodor uh, Pavlovich Karamazov, is quite a, quite, a, quite a mouthful. He is a lot like Dimitri. He's a he's, he's a sensualist as well. He's out living for the moment. He's passionate. He's all of these things. And boy, is he difficult to read because when, when he's on the page and he is um, there – it made my skin crawl. Like, this is not a man you're supposed to like. You do not like him. He is the world's worst father. He's just not a good human being. But it, it really creates sort of a sense of movement in the story. His presence really causes this dysfunction in the family. So the second reason you want to read the Brothers Karamazov is because as you read these three brothers, you start to identify with one of them more than the others. And you start to analyze yourself and say, uh, do I do this? How am I like this? What's going to how how this person turn out if he keeps behaving this way and it's sort of a, a look into your own future if you're not willing to change the way you approach your problems and questions so really good stuff okay time for a drink break and we're back <clears throat> excuse me the third reason why i would suggest somebody read the brothers karamazov is because it will uh, almost force you to confront your beliefs either for or against a higher power, against a God. Do you believe in God or not? Now, this podcast isn't a debate on whether you should or should not believe in God, and that's not the point of the book either. Uh, what the point of the book is, is to, is, is to ask you to ask yourself that question. I don't know. What do I believe? I've been taught my whole life that there is or isn't a superpower, uh, despite what my family, my friends, and my community have told me. What do I believe? And that's what this book does. And without giving any information away, I keep saying that because it's important to me. <laughs> I don't want to ruin this book for you. But what you have is a section in the book that is often referred to as the Grand Inquisitor. It is the most moving, most challenging thing I've probably ever read in literature. Not because it's hard, not because the words are big or because it's too philosophical, but because it made me turn inward on myself. I've, I've personally had a belief in God my whole life, uh, a, a higher creator, and that's for me to, to feel that way. But when you read this section of the book, it is by far the most powerful argument for atheism I have ever read, right? And, and just to sort of set the stage to get you ready for this when you're reading the book. Now, uh, well, let me back up. If you're also a believer in God or you go to church or whatever it is, don't let this dissuade you from reading the book. It's actually quite healthy to read this section and to question your own beliefs. So uh, what he, what, what's happening here to set the stage for you is you've got two brothers having a conversation. And of course, it's our intellectual, Ivan, who is making the case for atheism. He, he, is, he is making the argument that there can't be a God because uh, we have this thing called free will. He states that if you have free will, uh, that is probably the most cruel thing God could give you, uh, because with free will, it makes life too hard to live. It makes it almost impossible for us as humans to be good. There's just too many ways to fall. The temptations are too great. When we do something wrong, it hurts other people, and it just the implications of free will are almost corruptive. And he's making the statement that if there is a true God— why would he send the children he loves down to earth to experience all this chaos and hatred and horror through the process of free will? Why not just give us a free path back to, to, to happiness, essentially, right? And it's a great argument. I mean, a lot of the, uh, how many times have you heard people say, 
why do good things happen to bad people? That is what this book is trying to address in this section here. Why, if there's a God, do bad things happen to good people? Shouldn't they be protected? Shouldn't they have a, sort of a path towards happiness guaranteed? Why? Why, why, why? Now, Alyosha is the other side of the argument. Alyosha, uh, in the book, is um, on his path to being sort of a monk. Uh, and he uh, has a very strong relationship with Heavenly Father, or with his Heavenly Father or God, or whatever you want to choose to call the higher power. And uh, he, he gives a response to Yvonne's argument on atheism. And I'm not going to ruin it for you, uh, but he, he responds to it in a very beautiful way that is just as powerful, if not more powerful, for the case of there being a higher power. So it's this really cool thing to be able to read and, and to sit back and, and finally have that honest conversation with yourself about whether, where you sit on this topic, because it's an important topic. Ivan points out in the book that if there is no God— then all things are permitted. And that is a valuable statement, a very, very valid statement as well. If God doesn't exist, then you can kind of do whatever you want and, and all things are permitted. There's no consequences, right? I mean, yes, there are societal consequences, but in your heart and in your sort of long-term view, there's no consequence. So it, it just changes the game. So it's a question that you should find the answer to for yourself because it has great impact on who you are and how you live your life. That's why I love this book because uh, always having had that sort of conviction in my own heart, it made me go, wow, um, <clears throat> I have, <laughs> you know, I kind of had a moment there where I, I questioned whether there, there was uh, a God or not or my beliefs or my religion or my church and all those things. And I think that's healthy. I think you should have those conversations not just blindly accept everything. You should really think through it and, and think about what matters to you. Okay, we're going to go through two more reasons why I think this book is powerful to read, and then I'm going to give you some tips for uh, reading Dostoevsky himself because it is a, uh, it's a different reading experience. Well, the fourth idea here as to why you should read this book is it covers the importance of family. At its core, everyone, this is a book about dysfunctional families. It is a book about a father who does not care at all about his kids. All he does is want to live for himself, uh, be with women, get drunk, have a good time. Not at all trying to be a good father. And then you've got these brothers who are trying to like make sense of life because of this. And they're quarreling over um, sort of the family inheritance and other things. And it's just, it's so ripe with actual uh, sort of real family problems. I don't think there's a family in this world that is not dysfunctional in its own way, right? We all have challenges in our own families. Now, I love my family, but you know we have we have ways of falling apart when when things really matter too, just like your family does. So this is a good book to read for people who feel that because it shows the importance of getting through things despite the dysfunction about learning to overcome your differences and solving problems together as a family, because you are a family. Uh, you get to watch how this father and these brothers work through their challenges. They don't always do it correctly. That's for dang sure. And I'm not giving anything away here by saying that there is a murder in this book. In fact, this is a uh, sort of a whodunit uh, courtroom drama murder mystery thing. The father, as it says on the back of the book here, uh, is murdered. Right, and so we're trying to decide who uh, who has committed this murder and why, and of course, all roads lead to one of the sons uh, because of all of this, like you know, family dysfunction and chaos and the arguments over um, um, money and stuff. So you, as a reader, have to decide uh, like whose side you're on. But it shows you really the the, the value of the father son relationship, which means a lot to me. I am a father and I have four kids and I have found in my life that um, the amount of time that I invest into my kids pays off proportionately to the character that they have down the road. So if I'm willing to put in a little bit of time even to my kids, they grow exponentially in character as they get older. And it, you learn that as you watch Theodore not invest any time at all into his kids and what it does to them mentally, right? It, it's, it's not meant to be a guilt trip as to whether you're a good parent or not, 
it's just meant to sort of shine light on how important your role is. And at any point in time, you can start investing in your family. Whether you're the father, the mother, the child, whatever, we can all invest in our family and make it less dysfunctional. So it's a really great, really great concept there. That I think, I think it made me think about my role and how I approach my kids and my wife. So really fantastic. Okay, this last point I loved. Uh, the fifth point here. So I, as I mentioned before, this is a bit of a courtroom drama in the latter half of the book. And when you've got the murder which has taken place, there are, in, in any case, you've got the prosecutor and the defendant, the, 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 the defending attorney, the defense attorney. And in the end of the book, they both get to make their statement as to what happened. And the prosecutor uh, gets to go first. And again, I'm not going to tell you what he says or who he says it about or even who's on trial. What I will tell you is he makes a case that is irrefutable. It is rock solid, concrete. As you're reading it, you're going, yep, yep, yep. This all makes sense. This prosecutor is going to win this case. The defense has no chance, right? And so you're you're almost wondering why you should even read the last you know chapter or two of the book, the defense attorney's comments, because you know what's the point? The argument was so good. But then the defense attorney stands up. And he makes a comment, which is that psychology is a stick that has two ends. You see, what happens here is this is a book about psychology. And the prosecuting attorney essentially attacked the psychology of the, of the defendant. Essentially said, this person committed these crimes, and here's why. They were, you know, they did this, this, and this for these reasons. Essentially attacking his psychology. Well, the defending attorney gets up and says... Every bit of psychology is a stick with two ends. And what he means by that is that every belief you have in life has a, a second viewpoint, a, a different way of looking at it that is just as viable. So don't get so caught up and so committed to your beliefs. You need to be open-minded because when you get so tunnel visioned on, on the way things are, you often miss how they could be which is just as plausible. And it's a beautiful thing because she goes through each point and discusses why there is a viable alternative to it. So by the end of the defense attorney's <laughs> comments, you're like, oh my gosh, now I don't know what to believe because you can see how both of these arguments are just as valid. And I thought that was a really interesting um, sort of um, insightful way to look at life. You know, I, I, as a business owner, uh, again, as a father, often think that my point is correct. <laughs> yeah, I think I've got it all figured out. And what this taught me is that while I've put some time and effort into thinking about something, there is likely a, another option that is just as good. And it's this, it's this really sort of eye-opening experience to have your beliefs shaken as a reader and to realize that you are um, fallible to basic persuasion, right? Cool to see that I have some work to do in my own personal life there. I'm going to get to three tips on helping you read Dostoevsky here in just a second, but just to reiterate, this is a book I think you should read. Now, I know it's a commitment. It's 800 plus pages. It was written in the 19th century and it, it takes a while to read. So I would, I would not try to rush through this. Don't try to read it quickly. Uh, in fact, if you can read between five and 15 pages a day and just kind of move along at that pace, you're going to be in a really good position to not only um, value what you're reading, but to understand it, right? If you kind of set up a goal to read 50 pages a day or something like that, I think you're going to miss a lot of the weight of this book. So allow yourself to take time with this one. Allow it to sort of settle in and mean something to you. I think five to 15 pages a day is a really good place to be. Okay, so that's my recommendation. Now let's talk about reading Dostoevsky. If you've never read his books before, you've got to understand a couple of things. This is not like, re I mean, although it is fiction, it's not like reading Stephen King or uh, you know any of the Harry Potter books or something. Those books have been written in contemporary times where the language uh, kind of rolls with the way you speak today. Now, Dostoevsky's prose does not feel outdated. It does not feel like it was written in the 19th century. 
However, it is Russian, uh, and it has been translated to English or whatever language you're reading it in. And the Russian way of speaking, at least at that time, feels more jolted than we speak today. So when I read the book, it feels a little jolty, okay? Uh, and and it, th that can pull you out of the narrative at times. So be ready for that. Understand that uh, it's not going to flow as well as, as these novels you've been reading, these sort of summertime beach novels or whatever you're reading. This is going to feel a little more choppy. Allow it to be that. Just get past it, look past it, and be okay with it. Because the, the sooner you let go of that, the sooner you can get into the philosophy and the psychology of his characters and his books. Uh, just know that that's part of it. The second tip really is to know that uh, in his books, especially, there is sort of this terminology that takes place with people's names. Uh, oftentimes, you'll, you'll come across a character, and because and there are a lot of characters in this book, your brain wants to remember who's who, right? So you're, you're kind of logging in your head, or maybe you're taking notes when you come across, say, Dmitri Karamazov, you'll write Dmitri, one of the sons, or you'll try to remember that. Well, later on in the book, they might call him Mitya, Mitya. Or, or there are other names for this guy. Each of these main characters are often called by nicknames or pet names, or if the characters are being very formal with each other, they'll call them by their full name. Uh, they'll say Dmitry Karamazov. They'll, in conversation, say his whole name, which is really strange to me, right? Like my full name is Edward Charles Hood IV. That's my full name, Edward Charles Hood IV. And if in plain conversation, if instead somebody were to try and show respect to me and said, hi, Edward Charles Hood IV, how are you doing today? Like it would throw me off, right? That happens a lot in this book where characters will say the entire name and that will kind of pull you out of the narrative a little bit and trip you up. That's okay. Let it happen. <laughs> Just let it happen and, and you'll get used to it. And the moment that you sort of submit to that is the moment you'll start remembering who's who. Okay, you'll remember that Mitya is Dimitri and so on. It, it actually is quite simple. Just give it, give it some time. The third tip I want to give you, and the last tip here with, uh, with reading Dostoevsky, is this. Uh, don't, again, try to read it like, like uh, for entertainment purposes only. If you get into a book, a lot of people will say, do you have any recommendations for a good book? That's almost impossible to answer because I don't know what you're looking for. Are you looking to be entertained? Are you looking to be intellectually stimulated? Uh, wh what are you trying to accomplish? And then I can give you a recommendation. When people pick up Dostoevsky, like Crime and Punishment, for example, which is my favorite novel of all time, also Dostoevsky, uh, while it is entertaining and while you get to follow these characters on their adventures, that is not the reason you read Dostoevsky. You don't read him as though you were to read Harry Potter, which is I want to go on an adventure. I want to cast spells and I want to whatever, right? You are reading Dostoevsky because you want to ask and potentially answer the harder questions of life. Those questions that sort of boil in you that have been there for a long time. Who am I? Who is God? Uh, why, why do I do the things that I do? Why do other people do mean things to me? Um, is it okay like the, the, the whole thesis for crime and punishment, for example, is it justified to do something bad if I have righteous reasons to do it, right? Uh, so on a, on, a, on a big level like crime and punishment, is it okay if I commit murder as long as lots of people benefit from that murder? Is that justified then? That's what that book explores. Maybe you're not committing murder, but maybe you're telling lies, little white lies. And you might be thinking to yourself, is it okay to tell a lie as long as nobody gets hurt? The same concept, it's just on a different scale. These are the things Dostoevsky writes about. These are the ideas that um, really get at the core of who you are and, and the act of being human. That is why we read Dostoevsky. So if you come into these novels wanting fireworks and, and a big bang show sort of thing, you're probably not going to get it. But if instead you show up to these novels with a notebook and a pen and you're willing to listen for those big questions, and start to have a conversation with yourself about how you feel on them, Dostoevsky will change your life. As uh, Jordan Peterson once said, uh, he, he said that Dostoevsky has ruined all fiction for him. And, and I thought about that uh, for a long time, actually. Why would, why would Dr. Peterson say that? Why would he say that all fiction has now been ruined because of Dostoevsky? And I realized over uh, time 
that it's because most books have been written as the philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre said, which is just to entertain, simply to make you go, wow, that was great, that was fun, and then you put it down and you walk away. Very few books of fiction have been written to not only entertain you, but to change you in a bigger, more expansive way. Dostoevsky does that every time, and that is why he ruined literature for Dr. Peterson and, in, in, and for many people as well, because now you're looking for books that have... Uh, that have deeper meaning that you'll think about for many years to come and that you'll want to read again and again, because there's so much to get out of them. I hope you got something out of this. Uh, again, I encourage you to read the brothers Karamazov. It is well worth your time and your effort. You will be rewarded for the time you put into this book. If you found this episode helpful, please take a moment to uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, you can also go to the readwellpodcast.com and subscribe to my weekly newsletter where I issue uh, a, a, an email once a week with my essay of, of what I've been thinking about for the week or reading. I also give book recommendations there and other things. So I want to thank you again, and uh, I will see you guys all next week. Take care. If you'd like to take your reading to the next level, then head on over to our website at thereadwellpodcast.com. There you can get access to my weekly newsletter as well as up-to-date show information. Also, don't forget that I learned software development on the side just so that I could build a program to help us make better book notes as we read. If you're interested, go to highlightish.com. Think of highlighting a book, but add ish, I-S-H, at the end. Highlightish.com. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll see you on the next show.